Hello. Welcome, everyone. This is a special conversation with Maira Aguiar, a Marie Curie Fellow at the Department of Mathematics at the University of Trento in Italy. Maira is a biologist by training and holds a double PhD in life sciences and in biology with a specialty in population biology. During the last few years, she has been working in applied mathematics in close collaboration with laboratories and bureaus of epidemiology. She has recently adapted the scope of her Marie Curie project to include COVID-19. So first of all, hello Maira, thank you for talking to me today. Hi, good afternoon, Federica. Thank you for the opportunity. My pleasure to talk to you today. Where are you at the moment? And most importantly, how are you doing? Are you well and safe? Thank you for asking. Yes, I am. We are well and safe still in Trento, preparing to move uh, to Spain, where I'm going to perform the second main part of my Mahikohi uh, project. So today we're going to try and learn something new about COVID-19, thanks to your research and your experience. We also say that listeners will be able to submit questions to you, and uh, we're going to do a follow-up interview with those questions. Questions can be submitted through a Google form, and the link will appear on screen a couple of times during the interview. So first of all, what is your job? How are you involved in the research on COVID-19? All right. So my project, my Mahikubi project is in modeling and I was modeling happily uh, vector-borne diseases, uh, most focused on dynamical systems. And because of the uh, COVID-19 crisis or COVID-19 pandemics, I received uh, an invitation or request from the project officer if we could somehow include research on COVID-19 into the uh, project scope which I did gladly because as a modeler, uh, it would be very interesting to me to participate and to understand how the pandemic is going. And uh, since I was uh, going already for a uh, secondment period in the Basque Center of Applied Mathematics, I was uh, invited to uh, join the uh, modeling task force in the Basque Country to assist public health managers and the Basque government on the uh, COVID-19 responses. Do you have a sense of how research is being coordinated at the national level? You're talking about the Basque government, you are in Italy at the moment. You know, each country pushes its own research or there is a coordination and sharing of results, for example. So I believe that each country, each region in the world has its own uh, task force where it's often multidisciplinary and we exchange knowledge and information among mathematicians, modelers, epidemiologists, medical doctors, and public health authorities. The intention is obviously to share information as much as we can, knowing that for each region, each epidemiological scenario, the situation might behave differently. But uh, we see that there is a huge amount of publication, huge amount of information available to the uh, all types of public. And uh, that's the intention because we are learning about this virus. We are learning about the situation we never lived it in. So it's unprecedented, everything for us, for our generation. And uh, yes, the intention is to share and to learn from the other uh, regions as well. I know that there is a website where results from your research and that of all your colleagues is published. Would you like to walk us through this website so we see a yes. little bit what's going on and then if people have questions on what we're going to see, we'd be more than happy to answer those questions in a follow-up mm -hmm. interview. I'll be happy to drive you through the website. Okay, so the Basque Center of uh, Applied Mathematics in the Basque Country, as collaborating with the Basque government, was requested to have the results we are generating publicly available because not only uh, the public health managers are interested in knowing what are the new projections and predictions, but the public in the Basque Country and all the scientific committee would be interested to know what is going to happen given the research in a given region. It's important to say that the Basque Center of Applied Mathematics has three different groups working on modeling COVID, which are complementary. We have from epidemiological systems, stochastic process, which is what I'm doing at this moment, going through uh, Bayesian uh, problems and artificial intelligence. All of us are helping the Basque government with the same objective. It's to provide the most accurate projection and uh, prediction for the current epidemiological scenario. 
So if you uh, go through the uh, website, you have a brief introduction about the number of cases going on around the world, number of deceased. We have some simulators and the description of the modeling approach, where always we start from the simple version and increase its complexity based on the data you have and based on the knowledge you have about this pathogen. And this model gives you as an output the behavior of the epidemics. In this case here, we have so many lines because we are working with a stochastic model, so we have several realizations. And in the black dots are the data we have for the Basque Country. And we can, of course, make some predictions based on the current situation. We can uh, monitor uh, the growth of the epidemics for different categories, positive cases, hospitalized, disease, ICUs and recovered. And uh, from that on, we can uh, continue uh, looking at it, carefully monitoring and making some considerations as soon as we see that something is going wrong. You're talking about making predictions. So how far in the future are you able to see at the moment? How, and how does yes. it look like? What is the prediction okay. like? So at this moment, we see that we are far out of the exponential phase. So all epidemics have an exponential phase that without any kind of intervention measure, we would expect an explosion. So the number of cases would go up to all the population become infected. Because of the lockdown measures, the control measures were implemented, you see that the epidemic stopped growing and start going towards its plateau. So this is the cumulative number of cases. This model here is very good to give up to a two weeks ahead prediction. And uh, for the case of past country, we see that there is a stabilization, so there is zero increment at this moment. But uh, we cannot say yet what's going to happen in the next few months or in the next cold season. We are still learning about this virus. If we expect that it behaves as any kind of respiratory syndrome, we would expect that the number of cases would start increasing when the cold season comes, if we do not have a vaccine before. At this moment, we can just monitor and we see that for the past country, the number of cases or the infection is under control at this moment. How unique is the behavior of COVID-19? Or in other words, do these curves look like those of uh, past pandemics? Not pandemics, but new Outbreak. viruses. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I feel very uh, ashamed even to say this, but the um, behavior of a, an, an epidemic is boring. I mean, you have a, a, a exponential phase. Without control, it explodes. With control, it goes towards a plateau. So we don't have here the traditional epidemic curve where we have the incidences. So you have the increase and then you have the decrease. This is the cumulative, so that's why we don't see this curve. But uh, the behavior is expected to be as any uh, new viral infection we have in a, in a susceptible population. It will vary the velocity given the ability of uh, this pathogen to be transmissible or not. Nowadays, when someone says I'm working on COVID as a biologist, almost automatically, you know, one thinks, oh, are you looking for a vaccine? Your work contributes to understanding the behavior of the spread of the pandemic as a whole, and specifically in this case for the Basque region. So this helped like policymakers and healthcare yes. officials. Yes, we uh, help policymakers to take decisions. We do not interfere in the decisions, but we provide scientific ground for them to decide whether to implement a measure or not. We can also assist on the vaccine implementation whenever the vaccine is available in the sense that we can evaluate or analyze the number of cases after vaccination trials. So how much a vaccine can protect the population or not and how to best implement this vaccine. But uh, we do not act inside the laboratory and produce the vaccine. We just interpret the results and we uh, suggest ways of implementing it in a given population, in a given epidemiological scenario. Is there something else you want to show us on the website or you want to come back full screen? I can come back full screen. Um, I would be happy if people can just access and give a look. You are very welcome to uh, make questions. We often hear that the only way out of this is herd immunity or a vaccine. Can you talk a little bit about what herd immunity is exactly? Because the words suggest the idea that we all need to get the disease and then get over it. 
and be immune, provided that it's not even necessarily true that you get immunity uh, after getting COVID-19. So talk about all of that. It's just not clear at all. All right. Um, so heart immunity is a well-known uh, concept. And uh, what basically says that when a large proportion of the population is already immune against the pathogen, people which are not immune have lower probability of becoming infected. So uh, that's why it's a uh, herd immunity in the sense that if you assume a population, a closed population, where we have 90% of individuals immunized, either by a vaccine or by infection, natural infection, the 10% which are still susceptible would have very low probability to become infected or even lower probability to generate the chain of transmission. So the disease spread would not go through or would die out. The most effective way to acquire herd immunity in our times is via vaccination. It's more secure because vaccines are tested and you have uh, you know, uh, a good efficacy and um, you don't risk life of people in the case of COVID to attempt, and that's my uh, own opinion, to attempt to go through herd immunity by allowing everybody to become infected. It's very dangerous because we know that COVID has severe, it's very severe in some vulnerable populations. So we should try to avoid that at all circumstances. The vaccine is on the way. There are several groups working on it. We do not know yet if it would be conferring long-last immunity or short-last immunity, such as influenza vaccine. Every year you have to take a vaccine to be protected. And even though you are not fully protected because influenza viruses mutate very fast, so every year you have a new virus going on, which you are either partial immune or completely susceptible. So in the case of COVID-19, we have to uh, wait and watch and see what uh, is going to happen in terms of immunity. There have been other new viruses, even just in our lifetime, like SARS or the bird flu. And I do not remember catching those. I would remember that. I don't remember a vaccine for those diseases. So how did those viruses actually go away? And can it happen for COVID too? Yeah, so uh, those viruses, they are different from COVID in the sense that individuals which are infected uh, develop severe symptoms and they are very easy to be uh, traced and isolated. And when you isolate an infected person, you break the chain of transmission. So you can decrease transmission, you can stop transmission of the disease. COVID-19 is completely different as far as we could see because it's a virus that it spreads very fast and individuals are often asymptomatic, at least while they are transmitting. So it makes more difficult to stop the chain of transmission. That's why the lockdown measures would be very important at the beginning of the pandemic or during the exponential phase in order to avoid that the transmission chain increase and the transmission goes and all the population gets infected very fast. Yeah, so there are some uh, diseases that uh, you have vaccine available with uh, very good uh, protection, such as measles, for example. And from measles, we know that the virus is spreading very fast in the population. So you need a high proportion of the population to have to be within the herd immunity uh, scenario, so vaccinated in order to avoid the spread of the disease. Uh, in the case of influenza, the vaccine is not 100% or even closer to 100% efficacious, but it confers some partial immunity, and that's why you are uh, semi-protected against new viruses, which would share some of the antigens of the virus you receive the vaccine. But in the other case, you are also susceptible to the new pathogen mutating from a node influenza virus type. So that's you have to balance a bit to see how uh, immunity would be built up in your population given the characteristics of each of the virus we are talking about. Being an expert, what do you think of the job that the media have done in handling this pandemic? It must have been painful, I imagine, sometimes to watch the news and see the confusion. And I add to that by saying that they play a very important role because either they minimize the thing or they spread panic. That will reflect in your data at some point, right? People's behavior. So what do you think of the job that the media have done with COVID-19? All right. So that's my opinion. <laughs> I didn't model that. So COVID-19 pandemic uh, brought the best and the worst, I think. The best in the sense that people are learning, people are um, helping each other, and we are listening, and people are getting interested in science. That's very important. 
But the other hand, we know that tragedy sells a lot. So there is a lot of misconceptions, a lot of misinformation going on, and it's very difficult for non-experts to extract what is correct, what is not. Media is essential on that, and we try to give as much as accurate information as possible, but from time to time we see something outrageous coming up. Another important thing is that we see also that there is a lot of scientific knowledge generated, but on the other hand, we see a lot of uh, science monopolization in the sense that the high-impact factor journals are allowing most of the uh, publications to be for a certain groups and the others are left behind, not only on COVID-19, but in other research areas as well. So this is something that we must still learn while living in this critical situation. And uh, I think we can do much better in that sense. What is, if you can name one, the main misconception that you have seen being circulated through the media and that you were also concerned about, that you thought, well, this is bad if people get it wrong. It's, it's important. Well, what we were talking about, uh, there are some uh, research groups that eventually mentioned that the more than 50 or 60 percent of the population have been already infected. So the lockdown was not needed or people can uh, lift the lockdown completely immediately without any uh, extra care. So this is very dangerous because we do not know yet what is going on. So serological studies shows that very small proportion of populations which were hard hit by this uh, epidemic or this pandemic were acquired. So populations are still susceptible and a lot of infection can still occur. And uh, without the vaccine and without better knowledge on the impact of this new virus in the population, we should be very careful. Even though lockdowns and these restrictions are very painful, I know it is for me as well and for everybody, but it's better to try to save lives using what we can, the gun we can, to fight as we can, so to avoid transmission. I might be infected, and even though asymptomatic, I can transmit to my neighbor, which is 85 years old and have three pre-existing pathologies and would definitely be severely affected. So if I stay at home, I protect him. And the other way around. So if uh, he stays at home, he would protect the others. So that's the best thing we can learn from this uh, situation. Now, it works. You're also a mom. You have two children at home and your husband. How has it been to handle the lockdown as a family? But from your children's perspective and your, your own as, as a researcher, you know, you kept working, you said, so especially some other Marie Curie fellows were sad because their project came to a stop or a pause. But actually, you felt much more pressure to keep working. Yes. So it was, it, it is still very hard. Now um, we are seeing kind of a light in the end of the tunnel. This is that we are preparing for moving. So we are with that expectation of being able to travel, to go out again with all the security as possible, masks and, and avoiding um, close contacts. But I mean, to be a modeler during this crisis with two small children at home, it's crazy. So we are very lucky because we are together. I know that people were, after the lockdown, uh, were split. So we had the husband in one country and the mom with the children with another. So that's not our case. I have my husband here, which helps me a lot as well. So he's my uh, partner also in work. Uh, and we are working together. But we had to shift our time because with two children, we had to do many other things. And uh, to keep science going, we had to opt to, to work during the night while children are sleeping or resting. It's very exhaustive, but it's also a good opportunity for us to live and to be able to contribute uh, to the science in these times. It must be so hard, so kudos to you and to your husband, yeah, whom I love this. You just mentioned he does the same thing you do. You're like partners in life and uh, in, and in crime. crime. Yes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I am biologist. And he's a theoretical physicist, so we just combine our knowledge and uh, we make explosive and accurate models for any kind of infectious disease. Now very focused on COVID-19. And yes, we are partners, even that. Well, thank you very much for sharing your experience with me today. We remind all the listeners that... When they have questions, they can submit it through this Google form that appears on a screen and we will answer these questions. Well, 
you will, in a follow-up interview. Um, speaking of being up to date, though, I would like to mention that I do have my own go-to sources as a non-expert, and that would be the John Hopkins Coronavirus Research Center and worldometers.info. For guidelines on how the pandemic is being handled, I really like to mention this website, endcoronavirus.org, which is a project led by Professor Yanir Baryam, president of the New England Complex System Institute, NEXI. What are your references? Can you share some references also? Yes, I mean, absolutely. for non-experts. Yeah, I mean, uh, WHO has a very nice daily report on the number of cases. Uh, it's, it's very easy to accept. If you Google COVID report, WHO, you find it. ECDC as well. Um, and uh, I read a lot on uh, on the media from uh, New York Times or BBC in terms of uh, different um, situations in different countries. And more importantly, I try to find websites of Bureau of Epidemiology or health departments for a specific region. For example, there is a, a website for the Basque government where we can have a, also a daily report on the number of cases. In my case, I'm working direct with them. They share the data with me directly, but uh, I avoid any kind of delay in receiving this data as soon as I go to the reports. And the same here for Italy and Portugal and Brazil. Maira, thank you so very much. I'm so happy I know you. This was very useful and I hope that some people listening to this will have learned something and will appreciate the opportunity to submit the questions. It's so important to understand and to be aware of the situation we're all going through. Thank you so much for your precious time. Absolutely, Federica. Any time was really a pleasure to talk to you and I'm happy to answer any further questions. Thank you so much. Welcome.